Welcome to The Long and the Short, a show where you can expect an honest take on trading, something you won't hear elsewhere. I'm your host Sandeep Rao. In our last episode, we explored a fascinating market anomaly known as the turn of the month effect or TOTM. Starting today, we shift our focus to one of the foundational pillars of systematic trading, mean reversion. I briefly touched upon mean reversion in episode 5 of The Long and Short. Do watch it if you haven't already. We've also completed a three-part series on trend following the first foundational strategy type. This time, we move to the next one, mean reversion. A concept so powerful that legendary investor Jack Bogle once referred to it as the eighth wonder of the world. So without further ado, let's get started. As I often do, let's begin with the origins. The term reversion first emerged in the laboratory of the Victorian polymath Sir Francis Galton in a very different but super fascinating context. Do watch episode 5 of The Long and Short for more context. Today, I move further. Before the formalization of mean reversion in trading, 19th century investors navigated a world of investing defined by extreme volatility and lack of reliable financial data. The idea of the price reverting to a fair value first emerged in the fundamental investing world. During this era, valuation was a handcrafted exercise, each to their own type. And the primary clues for an asset's usual or fair price were its dividends. The concept of mean reversion existed in a very basic form among investors who believed that if an asset's price fell below its average, it was a signal to speculate on its eventual recovery to its usual or fair price. This was also a period where growth investors used to argue that recent earnings were more relevant than long-term averages, creating the first documented tensions between trend following, that is momentum, and mean reverting, that is value philosophies. Then came the Great Depression of 1929 and around the time was born the idea of value investing by Graham and Dot, which essentially said every security has an intrinsic value irrespective of its price. Around the same time, there was a parallel development happening in the technical analysis space by Charles Dow. Dow identified three primary movements. The primary trend, he called it tide. The secondary reaction, that is waves. And minor trends, that is ripples. The secondary reaction is nothing but technical mean reversion. Dow observed that after a significant primary move, the market often undergoes a corrective phase that retraces 33 to 66% of the previous price change. This was the first reference of price reversion, especially after a trend had become overextended. By 50s, the concept of oscillators was born. George Lane developed the stochastic oscillator, also known as Lane's stochastics. Lane's stochastics finds the range between an asset's high and low price during a given period of time. The current price is then expressed as a percentage of this range, with 0% indicating the bottom of the range and 100% indicating the upper limits of the range over the time period covered. The core idea behind this indicator is that prices tend to close near the extremes of the recent range before turning points. From 50s onwards, in the world of technical analysis, mean reversion measurement went through three phases. First was the Lane era fixed range momentum, which meant if price reaches the upper bound of a range, the odds of it reverting are high. Overbought, oversold thing, that stochastic oscillator indicated. Then came a phase of channels, envelopes, and bands. In the 60s, there was something called Wilfred Ledo's two line chart, which was two moving averages, one calculated using highs and one calculated using lows. Then came Chester Keltner with his Keltner channel, which was a 10-day moving average with two bands calculated as a factor of the ATR, that is, average true range. Originally conceived as a trend-following indicator, but was used even to identify range-bound markets. Later, Bob Brogan and Mark Chaikin came up with BOMA bands. What they did was again calculated a SMA with say a look back of 21 period on daily. Then calculated upper and lower bands based on 250 day look back or 12 month look back to calculate what they called containment percentage. They drew an upper band where 85% of all data is greater than the average. Likewise, for lower band, they drew it at a point where 85% of all data is below the average. This was the precursor to the popular and more statistically robust Bollinger Bands. 
As an options trader, John Bollinger wanted to measure volatility. He chose standard deviation as an engine for this band because he identified volatility as the essential variable for determining proper width of the band. After evaluating numerous measures of dispersion, he concluded that the standard deviation calculation provided a superior result primarily due to the squaring of deviations from the average. The squaring process inside the standard deviation calculation magnifies larger deviations. This makes the bands extremely sensitive and quick to react to large non-random moves in the market. Between the 1980s and now, Bollinger bands remain one of the most intuitive and robust measures of price deviations. Moving further, in this episode, we will focus on two key ideas. The concept of standard deviation and how Bollinger bands help us identify points of reversion to mean. Let's start with the concept of standard deviation. I would like to call it the second most important statistical measure after the mean. To understand standard deviation, we would need to understand the mean. The mean is one of the most simplest and as the statistician Steven Stigler says, it's perhaps the most radical statistical operation ever devised. There's a very insightful article by one of my favorite writers, Tim Harford, on the idea of average. We'll share it in the show notes. It's a simple operation of adding up all the data points and dividing it up by the number of data points. It cannot get more simple and elegant. But we all know that mean as a measure has its problems too. One of my profs used to say, would you jump into a river with an average depth of four feet? There could be many parts of the river with just one feet depth and some with 12 feet. It's the 12 feet one that would kill you. Hence, knowing the variation in the depth is important and that's where standard deviation comes in. The mean represents the central tendency. In our example, the river's average depth of four feet. But what truly determines safety is the standard deviation, which captures how wildly conditions vary around that average. When the standard deviation is low, the environment is predictable and stable, making outcomes safer and easier to plan for. When it's high, conditions become uneven and unpredictable, increasing the risk of sudden shocks and adverse outcomes, even though the average itself hasn't changed. But mean and standard deviation values by themselves are not enough. It's important to see it in the context of the distribution of data, which is how many instances in the context of the data fall outside the mean. In other words, how many 12 feet instances does the river have? Now let's take a look at this example from Nifty. Enough of drowning in the river. I will take an example of Nifty gaps particularly. Gaps are calculated based on current day open price minus previous day close price. We do that for all days in our look back period. Let's say in 2025, the mean absolute gap was 71.24 points, which is the average of all absolute gaps. What this tells us is that on an average, the gap up or down that Nifty experiences is 71.24 points. Would that data point by itself help? Some bit, yes. But like the river example, you cannot trade with this knowledge. This is where we need to know the empirical rules of normal distribution. In the Nifty example, the standard deviation is at 101.06 points. What that means is 68% of times, the gaps in the existing example fall in the range of 71.24 plus or minus 101, which is one standard deviation. 95% of times, the gaps in the sample fall in the range of 71.24 plus or minus 202 points, which is two standard deviation. And lastly, 99.7% of times, the data falls in the range of 71.24 plus or minus 303 points, which is three standard deviation. In other words, standard deviation helps us measure how far a given data point is from the mean. From that comes another interpretation. The farther the data point is from the means, the greater the probability of it coming closer to the mean mean reversion that is. Say if you have a gap of 500 points on a given day, you know that the odds of such a gap are very low and over coming days, the gap should get smaller in a way coming closer to the mean absolute gap. While I share these statistical concepts, I must call out that the stock market data is not necessarily normally distributed, but that's for another future episode. For now, it's okay to assume that it is. 
With the basics of mean, standard deviation and normal distribution sorted, let's look at John Bollinger's Bollinger Bands indicator and how that helps us in the context of mean reversion. Remember John Bollinger was more of a discretionary trader and hence my explanation of this indicator will follow that approach. The purpose of this explanation is to understand how mean reversion plays out in a price series. Once we understand that, we can work towards making rules around it. John Bollinger's starting point was more meta rather than tactical. He is very clear that Bollinger Bands are not overbought oversold indicators and do not provide continuous buy or sell signals. Hence, a price touching the upper band is not automatically a sell and a price touching the lower band also is not automatically a buy. The bands exist to define relative highs and lows, not turning points. Their role is to establish a statistical framework within which price action can be evaluated rationally rather than blindly. Mean reversion in Bollinger's view is therefore conditional, not mechanical. Building on that foundation, Bollinger defines mean reversion as the tendency of price to return towards its statistically normal range after moving away from it. In Bollinger Band terms, this mean is the middle band, typically a 20-period simple moving average that represents the intermediate term trend. However, he stresses that mean reversion only works in the right market environment. On a side note, every successful discretionary trader I have met has said the same thing. It's all about the regime. You need to find a way to understand the particular regime the market is in, or better still, the turning points of regimes. The identification of market regime is therefore the first analytical step. Bollinger looks for conditions where the moving average is flattening or gently sloping. Volatility is stable or contracting, and the price is oscillating around the mean rather than accelerating away from it. In such environments, touches of upper or lower band carry very different meanings than they do during strong trends. A quick rejection back inside the band often signals exhaustion rather than continuation. For instance, look at this nifty daily chart with the Bollinger Band with 20 SMA and 2 standard deviation settings applied to it. You will see very few instances of a close above the upper band here. While that's not a signal, what that means is the price has closed above 2 standard deviations of the 20 period SMA. So greater odds for a minor reversion. It cannot be a signal to short by itself. Because Bollinger Bands are volatility adjusted, sustained volatility expansion causes the bands to widen, which reduces the frequency of closes outside the two standard deviation envelope. As a result, in a stable uptrend with controlled volatility, such as Nifty in 2025, closes above the upper band tend to be infrequent and often coincide with short-term exhaustion rather than trend termination. This makes the upper band close a context of stretch, not a standalone short signal. Also, Knowing that indexes have an inherent positive drift is key. That, in a way, defines our regime. 2025 is a good year to look at instances when price has stacked along the lower band. As always, while that by itself is not an entry, but it's a good point to start watching the price action. That is, looking for a reversion to mean and then maybe further up towards the upper band. In an index with inherent positive drift, interactions with the lower Bollinger Band are often more informative than anything else. While not entries by themselves, they mark zones where downside volatility has expanded sufficiently to warrant monitoring for mean reversion back towards the 20 period average and potential continuation towards the upper band. And to repeat it like a broken record, this approach cannot be mechanical. Markets go through trending and mean reverting phases. Each phase has its own lifespan. Hence, it's important to look for mean reversion after market shows considerable trends. Likewise, if markets have been consolidating, you would want to look for a trending behavior in the future. Lastly, while John Bollinger talks about W and M patterns, I would say it's very subjective and hard to trade such patterns and hence I did not bring it up. 
For me, the biggest reason I would want to understand Bollinger Bands is because it visually shows us what standard deviation looks like in the context of a price series. It visually signals possible extremes and that's what I would want to look for. In summary, we trace the evolution of mean reversion in trading from its early use by fundamental investors to the way market technicians developed indicators to measure it. We then explored the statistical foundation that underpinned the concept, focusing on the ideas of mean, standard deviation and normal distribution. Building on that, we examined Bollinger Bands introduced by John Bollinger as a visual and intuitive way to understand how price interacts with its average and how dispersion expands and contracts around it. While I'm not a big manga fan, I do respect him. He once said, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there. Standard deviation and data distributions serve a similar purpose in markets. They help us identify zones of elevated risk and sometimes opportunities. While they are powerful tools for trading mean reversion, they are just as important for knowing where and when not to trade. That brings us to the end of this episode on mean reversion trading. In the coming episodes, we'll go deeper exploring how to design and structure systematic mean reversion strategies, the role different time frames play, and the trading instruments best suited to express reversion tendencies in the market. I hope you found this episode useful and interesting. Do share your questions, thoughts and feedback in the comments. I'll do my best to respond. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.